Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's event, which is titled Using EEG to Evaluate the Behavioral Effects of Benzodiazepines in Rhesus Monkeys. This webinar has been sponsored by DSI, a Harvard bioscience company, so big thanks to them for making this event possible. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Leigh Sparrow, who recently completed her postdoctoral studies at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, where she is currently an instructor. Dr. Barrow will present recent research demonstrating the behavioral effects of benzodiazepine drugs in a non-human primate model and how they correlate with telemetry-based EEG recordings. And with that, I'd like to pass things off to Dr. Leigh Sparrow. Uh, Leigh, thanks so much for joining us today. And feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Leon, for the introduction and also DSI for the invitation to give this webinar. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Liam already introduced me, my name is Lais Bahu, and I'm an instructor at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today, in which I'll be talking about using electroencephalography, or EEG, to evaluate the behavioral effects of benzodiazepines in rhesus monkeys. The learning objectives for this talk are to gain a conceptual understanding of benzodiazepine pharmacology and GABA-A receptor modulation, become familiar with the main models used to investigate the behavioral effects of benzodiazepines in non-human primates, learn the dose and topography-dependent EEG spectral power changes induced by benzodiazepine drugs across species, and also describe how benzodiazepine-induced EEG changes correlate with the different behavioral effects of these drugs. So benzodiazepines are among the most widely prescribed psychiatric drugs in the United States and in the world, with more than 1 in 20 people filling a benzodiazepine prescription each year in the United States alone. This is a list here on the slide of the most commonly prescribed benzodiazepines and benzodiazepine type drugs, of which the most well-known are diazepam or valium, alprazolam or xenex, and clonazepam or clonopin. Although these drugs can be prescribed for several different conditions, anxiety and sleep disorders account for the majority of benzodiazepine prescriptions. In fact, the benzodiazepine type drugs called Z drugs listed here on the slide are among the most largely prescribed sleep aids, particularly Zofidem or Ambien, which is one of the five most prescribed psychiatric drugs in the US. Benzodiazepines act by binding to a specific type of GABA receptors called the GABA-A receptors. GABA-A receptors are composed of five distinct subunits with GABA binding to the site between the alpha and the beta subunits. Binding of two GABA molecules leads to the opening of this ion channel, and benzodiazepines bind to a separate binding site located between the alpha and the gamma subunits. GABA binding is still necessary for benzodiazepines to exert their effect, and because of that, they're considered positive allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor. And while there are six different types of alpha subunits that can compose a GABA-A receptor, the major targets for benzodiazepines are GABA-A receptors containing alpha-1, alpha-2, alpha-3, and alpha-5 subunits. So conventional benzodiazepines like alprazolam or diazepam are non-selective, meaning that they bind to all of these four subtypes of GABA-A receptors. And this is, uh, as you can see on the slide, is a different view of the GABA-A receptor looking at it from above. And you can see the GABA binding site between the alpha and the beta subunits and the benzodiazepine binding site between the alpha and the gamma subunits. As I already mentioned, benzodiazepines are commonly prescribed for the treatment of anxiety and sleep disorders. However, they also have other clinical uses, including myo relaxation, seizure disorders, and alcohol withdrawal. And new potential uses are being also investigated, including for the treatment of spasticity and chronic itch. However, given the high prevalence of anxiety and sleep disorders, these are still currently the main reasons for benzodiazepine prescriptions around the world. Benzodiazepine use and prescription have been increasing dramatically in recent years. And more than that, benzodiazepine use also increases with age, with an average of almost 10% of the population between 75 and 80 years old being prescribed a benzodiazepine. Importantly, according to these data from 2008, benzodiazepine use is markedly higher in women compared to men, 
most likely because women are not only more likely to see a doctor and consequently be given a prescription of benzodiazepines, but also they're more likely to abuse benzodiazepines in general, and the abuse of benzodiazepines also has been increasing in recent years. So the increase in benzodiazepine use may be due to an increased incidence of anxiety and sleep disorders in current society, uh, since these are their main therapeutic uses. However, increased benzodiazepine use also comes with many unwanted side effects, of which the most prominent and problematic is their abuse potential. Importantly, all of these effects of benzodiazepine drugs can be modulated in the laboratory, particularly with the use of highly translational animal models, such as non-human primates. Specifically, in our laboratory, we have used rhesus monkeys to investigate the therapeutic effects and abuse potential of benzodiazepine drugs for many years. And a lot of the work I'll be showing here today is from the laboratory of my forever mentor, Dr. James Rowlett. But going back to our models in non-human primates, the anxiolytic effects of benzodiazepines can be measured using the conflict procedure. The sedative effects of benzodiazepine drugs can be measured using quantitative behavior observations or actigraphy, and the abuse potential or the reinforcing effects of benzodiazepines can be investigated using drug self-administration models. Today, I will go over all of these models and show you some data from our laboratory with conventional or non-selective benzodiazepines so you can become familiar with the main behavioral models used to investigate the behavioral effects of these drugs in rhesus monkeys. Starting with the conflict model, which is a model used to measure the anxiolytic-like effects of benzodiazepines. In this model, animals are trained to respond for food delivery under two distinct components, and response in one of the components is suppressed by the presentation of a punishment. In this example, during a non-suppressed component, completion of a response requirement of 18 lever presses leads to the presentation of a food palette associated with the presentation of a very specific color of light, which is a red light. During a separate, compo separate component, the same response requirement leads to food delivery, now associated with a different stimulus light, a green light instead. However, during the schedule of food delivery, a concurrent schedule of foot shock delivery is present under a different response requirement, in this example, in fixed ratio 20, uh, or 20 lever presses. And once the animals learn that responding under the component with a green light will result in the presentation of foot shocks, animals basically stop responding under that component, which now can be called a suppressed component. So this graph uh, represents what you see under baseline or vehicle conditions uh, of the conflict model. On the y-axis, you have responses per second during a conflict session, and you see high rates of responding under the non-suppressed components shown in yellow, and basically no responding under the suppressed components shown in red. What is important for this model, however, is that benzodiazepine drugs that have anxiolytic or anxiety-reducing effects in humans will increase response in the suppressed component of the conflict model. As you can see in this example, increasing doses of alprazolam or Xenex increase rates of suppressed responding. When you get to high enough doses, suppressed and non-suppressed responding are at the same level, which is what we call an anxiolytic-like uh, effect or anxiety-reducing effect. If you go higher with the dose, you start seeing motor impairment due to the sedative properties of this drug at higher doses. And in this case, both suppressed and non-suppressed responding start to drop. So this here is the effect that we are looking for, a dose of a benzodiazepine that will have an anti-conflict effect or anxiolytic-like effect by increasing rates of suppressed responding without altering responding under the non-suppressed component. And in our laboratory, we have used this assay to screen new benzodiazepine type drugs for anxiolytic effects and also to understand the GABA A receptor pharmacology underlying the anxiolytic effects of benzodiazepine drugs. Now, getting to the sedative effects of benzodiazepines, one of the measures that we use in our laboratory is quantitative behavior observations. During these behavior observation sessions, we can measure not only species typical behaviors, but this technique also provides us with highly translational sedation measures adapted from levels of arousal as defined by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. In our observation experiments, 
Arousal is measured by the ability of the animal to respond to external stimuli presented by the observer. And uh, these are some examples of species typical behaviors measured during observation sessions, including scratching, self grooming, tactile oral exploration, and foraging for food. And we also include different sedation measures in our observation studies. During observation sessions, observers who are blinded to the treatment are trained to record a range of behaviors for each animal in 20 intervals of 15 seconds. So in a total of a five minute sampling period, using an observation sheet that is similar to this one shown on, shown on the slide. We record each time a specific behavior happens during the 15 second interval, and the score for each behavior is calculated as the number of 15 second intervals in which the behavior has happened during that five minute trial. During baseline observations, animals tend to express species specific behavior, species typical behaviors, such as passive visual behavior when they're just watching the other primates in the room, including us, the human primates, locomotion, self-grooming, and tactile oral exploration, while drug-related behaviors such as ataxia and different levels of sedation are not generally observed under a baseline condition. And regarding the sedation measures more specifically, the first level of sedation scored is restly posture, during which the monkey has his or her eyes closed for at least three seconds, but is easily roused if presented with stimuli. In this case, the, the observer calling his or her name, approaching the cage and tapping on the cage. If the animals open their eyes in less than three seconds after the presentation of all these stimuli, then we would score that as restly posture. This graph then represents the cumulative score on the y-axis during a behavioral observation test session when the monkeys were given increasing doses of alprazolam or on the left and diazepam on the right uh, and the doses are shown on the x-axis. Notice that lower doses of the benzodiazepine drugs will increase rest sleep posture. The second sedation measure we adopt in our observation studies is moderate sedation. For scoring this behavior, animals must have their eyes closed for at least three seconds, but take more than three seconds to respond to the same set of stimuli used for the rest sleep posture. So generally, higher doses of benzodiazepines are needed in order to achieve this uh, next level of sedation measure, as you can see with the effect of oprazolam on the left. Finally, the last level of sedation measured during our behavior observation studies is deep sedation. To score deep sedation, an animal must remain with their eyes closed for the full 15 second interval after the presentation of the series of stimuli I described before. So only the highest dose of alprazolam and diazepam induce deep sedation in our studies on the example that I'm showing here. It is important to note that because these behaviors are being scored in the same animals, they're, they are mutually exclusive, and that's why with higher doses of benzodiazepines, you don't induce, you don't see a rest sleep posture because these doses are inducing deeper forms of sedation instead. In addition to behavioral observations, we can also use actigraphy to study the effects of benzodiazepines on daytime activity and on sleep-like behavior. So actigraphs are accelerometer-based devices like the Fitbits that a lot of us use on our wrists that can be attached to a metal case so that monkeys don't get to it and uh, try to destroy it. So this metal case is then attached to a collar, which goes into the monkey's neck. And with the collar, the, the monkeys can go, can return to their home cages and move freely. And the active graphs then give us several measures of daytime activity and also activity-based sleep measures, such as uh, sleep efficiency, which is the percentage of the dark phase that the animals spend sleeping, sleep latency, which is the number of minutes it takes for the animal to start sleeping once the lights are turned off in the beginning of the dark cycle, and sleep fragmentation, which is an indirect measure of the number of times the animal wakes up or moves around during the night. An advantage of using activity is that it can give you both daytime and nighttime activity data. So for example, using activity, we have been able to show that benzodiazepine drugs can decrease general daytime activity when given at high enough doses. In these graphs, we show the effects of daytime treatment with the benzodiazepine drugs temazepam and azopiclone on daytime activity, shown in the y-axis as activity counts per hour, 
of adult rhesus monkeys with the highest dose of azopiclone decreasing general home cage daytime activity. Using this approach, we have also been able to show that benzodiazepines improve sleep-like measures in monkeys with a short baseline sleep, such as the monkey shown in this example, with both temazepam and azopiclone decreasing the animal's latency to fall asleep after evening treatments with the two benzodiazepine drugs. Finally, the abuse potential or reinforcing effects of benzodiazepines also can be measured in rhesus monkeys using the drug self-administration model. In this model, monkeys are implanted with a chronic intravenous catheter and fitted with a jacket and flexible tether to protect the catheter. An operant panel containing levers and lights is mounted on the side of the monkey's cage so that the animals can now respond for intravenous drug delivery in their, home, in their own home cage. The panel connects to an interface and computer which controls the delivery of drug intravenously through the catheter by controlling the activity of a syringe pump that is connected to the interface. So completion of a given response requirement will lead to the presentation of lights or drug-associated cues and the intravenous delivery of a certain dose of a drug. With this model, we can investigate the reinforcing effects of conventional benzodiazepines and also new benzodiazepine type drugs and the mechanisms underlying these effects. For example, in this recent paper, we investigated the reinforcing effects of benzodiazepine drugs in monkeys with a history of opioid self-administration. The graphs represent the number of injections or reinforcers, reinforcers earned during self-administration sessions ran on their progressive ratio schedule of drug delivery. In this study, animals were trained to self-administer the opioid remifentanil, represented in the graph as an R, and they earned an average of 15 injections of that opioid per session. When animals were given saline or vehicle in the syringe instead of the drug, intake was very low, as expected uh, in the absence of drug, and when given the opportunity to self-administer the benzodiazepine triazolam, which is a conventional benzo, they self-administered that drug above vehicle levels at at least one of the doses tested, with individual subject data shown on the left and group data by the maximally effective dose shown on the right. So these data showed that conventional benzodiazepines have reinforcing effects in animals with a history of opioid self-administration. So up until now, all the, all the models I mentioned relied on behavior primarily to model the anxiolytic or anxiety-reducing sedative and abuse-related effects of benzodiazepines. However, we recently ventured into using a new, even more translational approach for investigating benzodiazepine pharmacology, and that was the use of electroencephalography, or EEG, which is an indirect measure of brain activity. Previous studies in rodents and humans had shown that benzodiazepines modulate cortical network oscillations as reflected by a well-documented EEG signature. An important feature of EEG pharmacology is that changes in EEG spectral power induced by benzodiazepines represent a highly translatable biomarker being observed in rodents and humans. Therefore, the use of EEG for the evaluation of benzodiazepine effects has allowed researchers to complement commonly used behavioral assessments, which often lack um, face and construct validity. In fact, the conflict model, which is uh, the, the model that we use to investigate the anxiolytic effects of benzodiazepines, is a classic example of a useful model with predictive validity, but no face validity. However, the extent to which these uh, other species particularly highly translational species such as non-human primates, would show the same EEG effects in response to benzodiazepines remained unknown. Uh, and in the context of our research, EEG becomes even more useful when you consider that you can get to multiple effects of benzodiazepines by using this model. For example, EEG-based polysonography is the gold standard approach for sleep evaluation in humans, meaning that we would also be able to get to benzodiazepine-induced sedation using EEG-based sleep recordings. But most importantly, studies had shown that benzodiazepine drugs induce very specific changes in EEG patterns when given during the daytime. For example, in this study done in healthy human volunteers, anxiolytic or anxiety-reducing doses of the benzodiazepine drug isopiclone 
increased beta activity in the brain, as can be seen by the dark red demarcation on the top left panel. So on the y-axis, you have increasing doses of benzodiazepines going from top to bottom. And uh, on the x-axis, from going from left to right, you have the time after injection. Importantly, increased beta band EEG activity in response to benzodiazepines had already been shown in rodents. And this effect has been proposed as a quantitative biomarker for GABA-A receptor modulation, and more importantly, has been associated with subject-rated decreases in anxiety in healthy human volunteers and in generalized anxiety disorders. So increases in beta band activity seems to correlate with decreases in anxiety in humans as well. So while lower benzodiazepine doses are associated with uh, anxiety-reducing effects, high doses have been associated with sedative effects. The EEG correlates of benzodiazepine-induced sedation also have been established and include increases in delta EEG activity. Notice that in the same study, lower doses of azopiclone preferentially increased beta activity, while the highest dose also increased delta activity, as, as shown in the bottom right panel. As you can also see in this figure, benzodiazepine-induced changes in the EEG spectral power activity seem to follow a topographic distribution. So for example, beta band activity increases preferentially in central brain regions, particularly at lower doses, while increased delta activity is observed primarily in occipital brain regions. Also, studies have pointed for a decreased alpha and theta activity in occipital brain regions, as can also be seen here in this uh, study in humans. So all of these findings indicated the importance of multi-lead recording in assessing EEG correlates of benzodiazepine action, particularly recordings including central and occipital EEG derivations, and also indicated that it is possible to evaluate anxiety-reducing effects of benzodiazepine drugs by simply using EEG, and also the sedative effects as well. So based on these findings in rodents and humans, we can assume that the therapeutic effects of benzodiazepines follow a spectrum in which lower doses have anxiety-decreasing effects, while higher doses have sedative effects. In fact, looking at our conflict and behavior observation studies, you see that the dose of the benzodiazepine alprazolam that induced optimal anxiolytic-like effects in monkeys was 0.03 milligrams per kilogram intravenously, and then you need doses about tenfold higher to start seeing more profound sedative effects as seen in behavior observation studies, with the left here being uh, moderate sedation and the right being deep sedation. Therefore, based on these findings, we hypothesized that in rhesus monkeys, lower anxiolytic doses would be associated with increased beta activity, while higher sedative doses of benzodiazepines would engender increased delta activity instead. If these assumptions were correct, we would then be able to evaluate both anxiolytic and sedative effects of benzodiazepine in drugs, uh, drugs in monkeys simply by using EEG. So to achieve that, we used a fully implantable telemetry model from Data Sciences International that had four channels. We chose to use two of these channels as EEG channels, with one being at a central derivation and the other at an occipital derivation, in order to get to the two main topographic regions in which benzodiazepines induced uh, specific spectral power changes based on human studies. We also used one uh, electromyogram or EMG channel and one electrooculogram or EOG channel in order to have the same parameters of muscle tone and eye movement needed in order to perform polysomnography based sleep scoring in monkeys based on the American Academy of Sleep Medicine scoring guidelines used for human adults. So with this study, which was recently published, we aimed at establishing a non-human primate model for the evaluation of benzodiazepine EEG pharmacology. Before we get into the details of this particular study, I wanted to touch on the subject of why we chose to use rhesus monkeys, not only for this study, for, but for the studies being done in Dr. James Rowlett's lab for the past 20 plus years. One of the main reasons is that rhesus monkeys share GABA-A receptor subtype distribution in the brain, 
that align with that uh, of human findings, but differ from rodent findings, emphasizing the importance of using rhesus monkeys for the study of benzodiazepine pharmacology as a more translational model compared to rodents. Contrary to rodents, rhesus monkeys also are a diurnal species with a single consolidated sleep phase at night, which is very similar to the sleep patterns of humans, or human adults at least. And finally, rhesus monkeys present EEG sleep characteristics that are very similar to those of humans, including a clear differentiation between REM sleep and non-REM sleep stages in 1 and 2 and in 3, according to scoring based on the American Academy of Sleep Medicine guidelines. As you can see in this graph, uh, showing the percentage of total sleep time spent in each of these sleep phases throughout one night of polysonography-based sleep scoring, Adult male rhesus monkeys and he, adult male humans show a very similar sleep architecture and distribution of sleep phases throughout the night. So this is why we chose to use this model uh, in our laboratory. And in this study, specifically, we investigated alprazolam induced EEG spectral power or EEG bandwidth changes and sleep-wake states changes during the light or active phase as well as the effect of alprazolam on daytime activity and body temperature measures in four adult male rhesus monkeys that were all prepared with fully implantable telemetry devices. We chose to investigate the effects of the benzodiazepine alprazolam specifically because it is the most largely prescribed benzodiazepine drug in the United States. And also one, it is one of the drugs that we have tested extensively in our laboratory before allowing us to indirectly compare our EEG findings with previous behavioral findings. Based on the human literature, we expected that alprazolam would increase beta activity in central brain regions, increase delta activity in occipital brain regions, and also decrease alpha and theta activity in occipital brain regions. In fact, and luckily for us, that is exactly what we saw during our EEG spectral power analysis. These graphs show normalized relative power as a percentage of baseline, and treatment with alprazolam dose-dependently increased beta band activity in the central derivation, selectively, and increased delta activity in the occipital derivation as well. We also observed decreased alpha and theta EEG activity in occipital brain regions in agreement with our predictions and in previous findings in humans. And interestingly, we also saw a sigma power increase in central brain regions, which is in line with the well-known benzodiazepine-induced increases in slip spindle density previously shown during human sleep studies. And we also observed several spindles in our sleep recordings as well. As expected, we also saw a marked difference in the potency of alprazolam to induce beta band increases versus delta band increases. In order to compare potencies or frequency band changes, we used nonlinear regression analysis to compute the ED50 values for alprazolam at each of those two frequencies that showed a significant trend. And to the extent that beta band increases are associated with anxiety reducing effects, while delta band effects are associated with sedation, one prediction for the study was that there would be a potency difference between these two frequency band increases. And our analysis showed that these values were significantly different, indicating a, about an eightfold difference in the potency of alprazolam to increase central beta band frequency uh, versus occipital delta band frequencies. Accordingly, we also saw dose-dependent sedative effects uh, of alprazolam following daytime administration. All of the graphs here show minutes on the y-axis, and the highest dose of alprazolam that we tested significantly increased total sleep time and decreased time to fall asleep or a sleep latency shown in the top two top panels. The sleep-inducing effect was primarily associated with increases in N1 and N2 sleep stages, which are the lighter sleep stages. And this is also in agreement with findings in humans showing that benzodiazepines tend to suppress N3 or slow wave sleep and also REM sleep. And that's likely why we didn't see significant increases in these two sleep stages in our recordings, especially because there were daytime recordings. Finally, we also saw a dose-dependent decrease in peripheral body temperature, as shown on the left, 
and general locomotor activity as shown on the right, with higher doses of alprazolam significantly decreasing body temperature and locomotor activity, which is in agreement with the previous data showing that this dose was in, in fact a sedative dose. So in conclusion, this was the first study to demonstrate that a benzodiazepine drug also induces a signature dose-dependent EEG change in rhesus monkeys, and that this effect was similar to what has been previously reported, reported in rodents and humans, both at anxiolytic or anxiety-reducing doses and at sedative doses. We also show that a highly translational species showed the same topography-dependent pattern of effects on EEG power spectrum with benzodiazepine treatment, or oprazolam in this case, as seen in humans, further emphasizing the relevance and translational uh, application of our model. And finally, other translationally relevant effects were also observed, including decreased body temperature, which, ha which had been previously reported to be an effect of benzodiazepines at high doses, and increased EEG sigma power, which is a correlate of spindle density. Overall, we were able to show that EEG power can be used to evaluate dose-dependent benzodiazepine effects in rhesus monkeys and is a valuable model for studying benzodiazepine pharmacology. Regarding the EEG correlates of the behavior effects of benzodiazepines, increased EEG beta activity in central brain regions is expected at lower doses and can be proposed as a marker for the anxiety-reducing effects of benzodiazepines, uh, which would be in agreement with our conflict studies. On the other hand, increased EEG delta activity in occipital brain regions at higher doses is a correlate of benzodiazepine-induced sedation, which we had previously shown with our behavior observations and actigraphy models, and also we now showed with our EEG-based polysonography model. Based on our EEG findings, there is an eightfold difference in the potency of alprazolam to induce beta versus delta EEG activity increases, which is in light with our prediction of a dose-dependent effect in both the behavioral and EEG-related effects of these drugs. And finally, while we haven't yet started looking into this specifically, future studies will also establish the EEG correlates of benzodiazepine self-administration in order to determine the EEG signature associated with the reinforcing effects of these drugs and whether or not they match any of the therapeutic effects of benzodiazepines. So for example, there has been a lot of interest in understanding whether the anxiolytic effects of benzodiazepines contribute or correlate with their abuse-related effects. And that is something that we can now get to as well by associating EEG with the self-administration model. And with that, I would like to thank our lab members, particularly my mentor, Dr. James Rowlett, and other lab members who participated in these studies. Of course, the monkeys were the subject of these studies. It's an honor to work with this species. The UMC veterinary team for their constant care for our animals, as well as the DSI veterinary team for their incredible surgical services and help in establishing this model in our laboratory. I also thank the funding agencies for the financial support for these studies. And of course, all of you for attending this webinar and Jamie and DSI for inviting me to give this, uh, this talk. And with that, I will be more than happy to take any questions that the audience might have. Excellent. Thanks so much, Lace, for the fantastic presentation. All right. Uh, first question here uh, comes from Chris, who has asked, uh, could different GABA-A receptor subtypes play a role in the different behavioral and EEG effects you observed? Yes, thank you for this question. That's something that actually um, James has been looking into for the past 20 plus years. And I think right now we have an, an idea of which subunits of the GABA-A receptor actually play a role in the anxiety reducing and sedative effects of benzos as well as the abuse potential. So based on our non-human primate studies, which now seem to align with the, um, I, the, the, the predictions based on rodent studies as well. Anxiety-reducing effects are primarily mediated by alpha-2 GABA-A receptors. Sedation seems to be related to alpha-1 and alpha-3 GABA-A receptor activity. And unfortunately, the abuse potential of benzos involves, seems to involve alpha-1, alpha-2, and alpha-3 
GABA receptor. So all of the receptors involved in some form of therapeutic effect of benzos also seem to be involved in the abuse potential of benzodiazepines as well, which, which explains why so many people are now abusing benzos and the benzo use disorder has been increasing around the world as well. Excellent. Thanks, Lise. Um, mm -hmm. new, another question from Bernhard who's asked, uh, have you tried to correlate the anxiolytic-like EEG signature to that of other classes of anxiolytic drugs uh, like gabapentinoids? We have not, but that is definitely something that we want to do. Uh, another thing that we want to do is uh, basically test other benzodiazepine type drugs that, that we have in our tested in our laboratory that do not have uh, anxiety reducing effects in our conflict model. So for example, uh, we recently published a paper showing that an alpha-3 selective GABA-A uh, modulator doesn't have anti-conflict or anxiety reducing effects. So we want to test that drug to see what it would do, for example, to beta band uh, uh, activity in EEG. But that's a great suggestion and definitely something that we want to look at in the future. Excellent. Um, new question here from Tanishka, who's asked, can we differentiate between receptor subtypes using EEG? Um, I don't think you can. Uh, just because of the, the distribution of these receptors in the brain, they're really largely distributed throughout the brain. Uh, so you, I think it would be very hard to get to a specific region where you only have a subtype of receptors. What you can do, and that's something that we've been doing in the lab, is uh, using uh, selective GABA-A receptor modulators to understand the pharmacology. So you can get like an alpha-1 selective GABA-A modulator compared to an alpha-3 selective or an alpha-5 selective. And then using that sub pharmacology selectivity, then you can get to the effects of uh, uh, the role of each GABA A receptor subtype on the EEG effect of drugs. And that's uh, also something that we, we want to do and we're actually starting to do now in the laboratory as well. Excellent, uh, great answer, Lise. Um, Jerry has asked, what are the ages of your non-human primates and how does this relate to a similar usage for humans uh, with regards to age? That's a great question. So our uh, the non-human primates in this study are around 10 years old, and that would be an adult, uh, they're all males, and that would be an adult like between 50 and 60 years old, I believe. So um, that's around the age that we have for our monkeys. Uh, between seven and 17 years old, you'd consider them adults. And then after seven, 18 to 20, they start becoming geriatric monkeys already. Excellent. Um, Barack has asked, how do you see this biomarker approach improving drug development? Thank you, Barack Gunter. That's a great question. Uh, we've, uh, I particularly have tried working with uh, all of these behavioral models here in the lab and specifically for the one with the anxiety reducing effect or conflict model, it's really hard to, to establish, maintain. Uh, the, the baseline will actually fall uh, very quickly. So I believe uh, with the EEG approach, specifically for anxiety reducing effects, it it's a much quicker approach once the model is established to test whether a drug, a new drug would have anxiety reducing effect based on the beta band increases. Uh, that's the effect that we'd be looking at. Also, um, in terms of drug, the benzodiazepine drug development for as, as a sleep aid, because uh, we still don't have very many good sleep aids in the market, and we, we need to look into that better. Now we're able to look at not only whether a drug has a sedative effect uh, or not, but we actually can look at sleep architecture and see what these drugs to do to our normal sleep architecture, which is the cycling of the different sleep phases throughout the night. And that it would be something extremely important to look at if you're trying to propose a benzodiazepine as a sleep aid. So I do think that using EEG will uh, improve and uh, make it faster, the, the, the timeline for drug development. Great answer. Um, we have a question here from Rob Gould, who if you've been following us our webinars for a while, actually presented uh, in a webinar in 2018. Uh, and so thanks Rob for the question. He's said, great talk, Lace. Uh, really great validation of the translational utility of EEG. Uh, you mentioned the ability to seeing sleep spindles. Uh, can you quantify spindle activity? Thank you, Rob, for this question. And if, if he was here in 2018, you need to bring him back because I know his research is really awesome as well. Um, 
We do. So it's very easy to see them on our recordings. And there is a way to quantify spindle activity. You have to use MATLAB. And then there is a specific algorithm that you can actually download online that will automatically quantify spindle activity in your EEG recording, including if you're using the DSI model, or the, the extracts from the Panema software, you can use MATLAB to quantify spindle activity as well. Another way is to just do it manually, but if for like one hour recordings, that's fine. But if you're looking at full night, 12 hour recordings, that would be a little harder. So I'd highly encourage to look into the MATLAB um, alternative. Perfect, thanks, Slace. Um, question here from Adeli, who's asked, uh, thanks for the great talk and the nice data. Uh, I guess you're planning to look at EEG signature during self-administration. Uh, what kind of EEG signature might you expect uh, reflecting drug abuse liability for benzodiazepines? That's a really, in thank you for this question. It's really interesting um, and very important question. So um, I actually don't exactly know the answer to that. I, I kind of... I think it would be kind of a surprise, but I would not be surprised if we saw at least either be right before the, the, the injections or during the injections, an also an increase in central uh, beta band activity, just because there is, uh, people do believe that the anxiety reducing effects play a very important role in the reinforcing effects of benzodiazepines. So if I had to guess, I would say that at least you would see beta band activity increases with reinforcing doses of benzodiazepines. Excellent. Uh, new question here from Kurt, who's asked, what is the path of the, this research in the future? Uh, and will you use uh, EEGs in non-human primates to evaluate pharmacology of different bio, bio benzodiazepines? So this is a bit similar from a question bef uh, from before. but. Yeah, that's that's a great question. There's so many ways that we can go with this. But uh, yes, right now we are looking at different benzodiazepine, new benzodiazepine type drugs, uh, particularly selective benzodiazepine type drugs that may still have an anxiety reducing effect without having a, uh, an abuse related effect, although that seems like it'd be a difficult task to get to, specifically because we don't don't yet have selective alpha two GABA A receptor modulators. It seems like it's a challenge in terms of chemistry, but maybe one day we'll get there. Uh, so that is one thing to do. I think another important thing to do is look at chronic effects because uh, we have an interest in the lab at looking at development of tolerance and dependence with chronic benzodiazepine uh, treatments and what these uh, the chronic treatments do to EEG signatures and how that can predict uh, behavior effects as well. So that's another way that we, we were planning on going with that. And finally, um, Specifically for using EEG, we're also, our laboratory focuses on studying the abuse liability of drugs. So we're also looking at the effects of other drugs of abuse using EEG during the daytime and also the effects of these drugs on sleep-wake cycles, um, which is another way that we're going with this uh, research line. Excellent. Yeah, very exciting to look in the future there. Uh, another question from Bernard, who's asked, does the acute effect of benzodiazepines at the EEG level differ from that of the chronic effects? So yeah, that's something else that, that I just mentioned that we want to do moving forward. Uh, I do believe that we, you will differ, especially because of development of tolerance to these drugs. So while we see we've never done chronic uh, benzo treatments with EEG, associated with EEG, but we have done these treatments associated with behavior observations. We actually published a paper last year, uh, James did, not me. Um, but uh, looking at uh, I, what we see with the, key, the, with the uh, chronic treatments is that tolerance does develop uh, at, a, at a relatively fast rate to the sedative motor effects. So I would believe that higher doses that initially induce delta band increase in occipital regions uh, with the chronic treatment, you would, you would see that delta effect disappearing. And instead you would see the, that the higher dose, the high dose now because it's a chronic treatment would now start increasing beta band activity, uh, which would be in line with uh, chronic treatments of, with benzos in humans that initially may have some sedative effects, but then you start seeing the anxiety reducing effects creeping up with chronic treatment. And we believe that that's what we would see, especially with higher doses of a benzo. Excellent, uh, thanks, Lais. Another question about the future here, this time from Marcio Furtado, who also presented on a DSI webinar with us about EEG. Um, 
Marcio has asked, do you plan to study the effects of benzodiazepines on cognition and memory and its EEG correlates? Thank you for this question. That's a great question. Um, I, I would guess for the future, yes, for the for the near future, no, but we do have the capability of doing cognitive testing in the lab, particularly CANTAB. So uh, I think that is something that we need to look at, especially if we're looking at Someone else mentioned uh, drug development uh, for, for treating anxiety disorders or sleep disorders. I think we would need to look at the effects of benzos and how they correlate with EEG specifically so we can uh, identify the EEG markers of benzo-induced changes in cognition and memory. And it would be very interesting to look, for example, at uh, GABA -A, uh, selective GABA-A receptor modulators in that context. Uh, specifically for looking at alpha-5 GABA-A uh, selective drugs, because that seems to be the, the subtype primarily related to memory deficits. So definitely that's something that we should look into in the future. Excellent. Uh, great answer there. Um, new next question here from Alexandra, who's asked, do you plan on doing gender dimorphic rhesus studies to determine if females are predisposed to abuse or if this is driven um, more purely just by the increase in the prescriptions by the clinicians? Yeah, so we actually have been looking at um, the effects of benzodiazepines primarily in the our drug abuse model in, in females versus males. Uh, generally, one thing that I can tell you is that females in our lab will need higher doses in order to self-administer a benzo. So generally, you need higher doses for them to experience the reinforcing effect or maintain behavior. Uh, what we have looked at in the past is uh, di uh, gender differences in their response to combinations of benzodiazepines and neurosteroids as well, just because uh, of endogenous neurosteroids in females that may be modulating the effects of benzos. And we have seen some differences there too, uh, primarily showing that combination of neurosteroids with benzos increases the reinforcing effect in females, but not in males. So there seems to be like some some hormonal influence on these effects too. Uh, so I think there is there is that aspect of uh, prescription by the clinicians just because women are more likely to go see a doctor. But I think there is a biological factor in there too. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Lace. Uh, question here from Corey, who's asked: Has the EEG drug test produced any false positives or negatives? Uh, not until now. Uh, we do uh, repeat the baseline recordings and vehicle recordings, and I don't know if I was clear on that on my slide, but uh, vehicles never induce, even like an injection uh, right before the, the recording doesn't really change EEG uh, activity. And uh, what we do need to look at is whether a benzodiazepine type drug that we does not have, for example, anti-conflict effects, if you would have the same beta activity increasing effects because then that would be like a false positive in terms uh, but that is something that we need to look at but up until now we haven't seen anything that would indicate a false positive or negative excellent and i think in the interest of time we'll just have one last question here um Marilise has asked how long do you believe that the changes in the delta and beta waves uh, for benzodiazepine induced uh, for the benzodiazepine induction remain altered uh, if, if you're thinking about how long after the injection, so we actually uh, did the administration and then we looked at 30 minute intervals uh, for two hours. And during the first two 30 minute intervals, so the first hour, you still see those increases in beta and increases in delta. But are, are, are already on the second hour after the treatment, you those effects start to dissipate. So in terms of acute effects, it's actually pretty rapid. Um, we haven't pushed the dose like too high. Maybe with higher doses, you would see a longer, longer lasting effect. And that's why with um, when we do think about chronic studies, it won't, it, it won't be just a once a day injection or drug administration. Usually you have several time points of administration throughout the day. So, so you can make sure that the drug is on board uh, throughout the day. That's a good question. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Lace, uh, for the really fantastic presentation, as well as your great insights during the Q&A today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much, Lee, and thank you, everyone, for sending all those awesome questions. If you have any more questions, please feel free to send me an email. I'll be happy to answer them. 
Uh, so a big thanks to the audience, yeah, for the great questions and for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank Harvard Bioscience for sponsoring this event. So in closing, thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon.